Aloha. Welcome to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator from the Big Island. As you can see, I'm in my scrubs today and uh, also a worker in the ER. I'm welcoming a good friend today to our show, uh, Mr. Ken Zeri, who is the Hospice Hawaii president. Been that for many years, nurse for 33 years, was on the National Board of, uh, of Hospice Nurses, National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization board member, also founding board member at Kakua Mau. I am. Good to see you. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me on board. Thanks for being here. So we're going to talk about uh, a very, very important issue, which is hospice care today. Yeah. And we've entitled our show at your recommendation, The Myths of Hospice Care. Right. Why don't you unpack that for me just a little bit? Josh, I think that one of the phenomenon that we run into when we talk to folks about hospice um, is actually all summed up in the most common complaint, which is, why didn't I know about hospice sooner? Mm -hmm. When you kind of unpack that, to use your word, you really do come into um, understanding that there are all sorts of barriers, of emotional um, misunderstanding barriers about people getting access to hospice sooner. Yes. What we do know is that when you can have hospice in the last two or three months of life, it can be almost miraculous in what we can hopefully try to achieve with that patient and their family. And the beauty of it is it's generally covered 100%. That's, that's really important. So as a part of the larger dialogue of healthcare, uh, we know we have an aging population. Right. We have people with severe chronic illness. We have people with very advanced cancers that lived a long time. But at some point, people have an option uh, to go into hospice care. Does everyone go into hospice care? No. No, actually, um, nationally, between 45 and 50 percent of all Medicare beneficiaries, which is our largest, biggest piece of data, about half of all Medicare beneficiaries have hospice care in America. <clears throat> about, about 10 or 15 percent of those are discharged alive. They graduate. They actually get a little better. Uh -huh. um, and here in Hawaii, we're at about a 45 to 47, 48 percent probably at this point in time of all deaths yes. that occur in the state have hospice care. That's amazing to me. So that means a person has gotten very, very ill, and how do they qualify for hospice? How does, how does a patient even contact you? Does it always have to go through their doctor or through their nurse? Sure. How do they get to you? So the, the first simple question to ask is, um, the, the question we like is, would you be surprised? So Josh, if you were making a referral for a patient to me and you said, I don't know if this gentleman who's got a chronic debilitating uh, set of conditions, I don't know if he's eligible for hospice. I might say, well, Josh, would you be surprised if he was alive next spring? Mm -hmm. Because it's the fall right now. Right. That's kind of a nice six month window. Yes. And if you would think about this person, you think, you know, he's got heart disease and he's got kidney disease and he's got some, some pulmonary issues yeah, I don't really think he's going to make it past the new year, mm -hmm. then we need to talk about hospice care for him. Okay. So simply that kind of an initial screening mm -hmm. is the first way to start. Now, anybody can make a referral to Hospice Hawaii for hospice care. Yes. And they just call our number at 924-9255. It's, you know, Google Hospice Hawaii, right? And you, and you make that call. Are you, are you just on Oahu or are you, do you have affiliates? How does that work, just so people know? Sure. Hospice Hawaii is one of nine providers yes. in nine hospices in the state. We serve the island of Oahu. And then we also served Molokai for about 20 years. Oh, that's cool. Uh, sorry, 15 years. And about two years ago, at the request of the folks at Pulama Lanai, we began a hospice program on Lanai. So we're really proud of those folks as well. That's, see, that's extraordinary. Now let me take a half step back. Mm -hmm. uh, a patient, like you said, um, has been referred for hospice assessment. Uh, and it's because that they are felt by their provider to probably be somewhere near the last six months of life, because that's the qualifying sure. credential, it seems. Um, now, how do you then proceed? You have an individual that's been referred to you. Mm -hmm. I say this individual is, is a wonderful person. They've got, say, bad cancer. They're very sick. It's, you know, it's a worry. Why even bother? Why can't I just take care of them as their primary care physician or send them this is a somewhat rhetorical question, of course, yeah. but, or send them to the hospital down, you know, in the last few months of their life. Why use hospice? Well, Josh, so you're not going to be able to keep them in your ER. Right. That, that's the truth of it, right? For sure. I mean, unless somebody is really in the last hours of life. Yes. And frankly, most people don't want to be in your ER. It's not about your ER. Yeah. <laughs> They're <laughs> smart. I agree. <laughs> most people don't want to be in any hospital when they reach the end of their life. Hospice care as a philosophy was created 40, 45 years ago to say, how do we care for people in their last months of life 
in their own homes as an alternative to being in the hospital. Yes. So when you make that call or when, when an ER physician on Oahu makes that call, then we'll go and see that patient and we'll look and see what's going on with that individual. Uh -huh. So while we use the general term, would you be surprised? We actually have some specific guidelines from Medicare that we have to follow. Mm -hmm. And it's, we have to demonstrate that there's a medical necessity for hospice care. So we know how to look at conditions in the individual. So for instance, um, as a healthcare provider, I would say, uh, how many of their activities of daily living do they need assistance in, right? The, the ability to bathe yourself, the ability to feed yourself, the ability right. to make your own meals. Yes. And if they need help in two or three of those, then our, that's a sign that this person's kind of debilitated. Mm -hmm. We also look and see, have they lost weight? Um, do they have progressive infections? Are they going in and out of the ER a lot? Yeah. Um, those kind of some of the criteria that we look at to say, is this person going to be medically eligible for hospice care? Yes. Certainly with a cancer patient, we might say, well, what's the progression of their cancer? Yeah. But with a cardiac patient, we might say, what's the functionality of their heart? Yes. So our medical director, in concert with you, in collaboration with you, is going to, as her PCP, right. is going to say, yeah, we think that this person has got about six months or less to live. And we're going to do that. That's our job at Hospice Hawaii, to make sure that we, we demonstrate that. Yes, a question about why can't you just take care of them in the clinic or why yeah. can't they go to the hospital? Right. So you, you know as well as I do that hospitals don't have the space for this. They, hospitals need to have those beds moving for people that are really sick. <clears throat> and if you've got somebody that's had a, an immediate heart attack, you want that hospital bed for them. Mm -hmm. And the person who so has got just heart disease and, and needs a lot of help doesn't really necessarily need to be in the hospital. And frankly, it's not the best place to be. Right. And it, you can't go to their homes. Yeah, well, that was, that was where I was kind of headed. So yeah. hospice is, you, you used the word philosophy, which I really liked a lot, um, where it's a philosophy about getting people more comfort, more care that right. they need while in concert with being in the last six months of life, mm -hmm. based on the best expectation sure. that an assessment can do. Um, my uncle, died uh, at home, in home hosp hospice care in Philadelphia. Some places have hospice centers, right? right. They're facilities. Could you distinguish a little bit about what you do and sure. what's done in Hawaii? So um, hospice, when it was designed, was really designed to be care based at home. Actually, the, the principles of hospice came over from England mm -hmm. and it married up with our visiting nurse associations in America and hospice became a home care based model of care. So primarily what we're doing is we're sending a team of professionals to that patient's home to help that family care for them. Yes. In Hawaii, um, we see care for hospice being done in patients' own homes. We see it being done in nursing homes. That, so Hospice Hawaii has a, a couple dozen nursing home contract partners. Yes. So we can go to the nursing home and provide care to that because that's the place of residence for that individual. Right. We see care being done in some foster homes and care homes. Wow. And then we do have a couple of inpatient units in Hawaii that we call them hospice inpatient units um, or hospice residential units. Hospice Hawaii has um, our Kailua home, which is uh -huh. kind of in just one of the neighborhoods in Kailua. It's been there for 20 years. Wow. Five bed. Um, you just walk in and it's such a place of powerful spirit. It's just the mana is terrific there. And we care for people in the last months of life around the clock with our nursing staff in our Kailua home. That's, that's really exceptional. Okay, so I'm gathering, um, and I've experienced some hospice care because I, over the years, on occasion, I was asked to be supportive as a doc uh, for patients, especially when I was a primary care physician, that were very near the end of life and helping with orders. A patient uh, is felt to be in need. Right. They get referred to you and they get accepted into your program in this case. You've done the assessment at home. Then what happens next? Do they suddenly get... I'll toss out a couple myths or questions here. They suddenly get a lot of medications uh, to make them comfortable. Is is it meant to um, help them to the end of life? Is it meant to make them comfortable? What's really the approach that that happens at the clinical um, the clinical level? Sure. So the first thing that will happen is we'll ask the patient and families to sign consents and to, to sign paperwork that says Medicare can pay us because we're going to get paid by Medicare, HMSA, Kaiser, right. and Medicaid. So, so that, that's what covers it. Then the clinical team, the doctor, the nurses, the social workers are going to assess this patient completely and say, ask a simple question, what does this family need? to be successful in taking care of their loved one in their own home, mm -hmm. free of pain and suffering as best we can do, yes. um, surrounded by the loved ones that are coping well, yes. and really um, to, to live out the rest of their life in a way that reflects their values. We, we've been doing this thing called the bucket list, yes. um, right? To say, how do they do the things that are important in whatever time they have left? 
um, be it horseback riding or going to the ocean one more time. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we simply ask that question, where is it that there's distress yes. and how can we ease that? And where is it that there's opportunity for bringing life to a closure? Um, and closure not meaning how do we help them die, rather how do we help them live as fully as they can. Yeah. It's great work, Josh. It, it really does seem so. And, you know, I've seen a lot of people over the years in the hospital setting where they have told me, Doc, please make sure I get home to die at home. Or please, uh, you know, they're very afraid. Please make sure I don't suffer. And it sounds like um, hospice, at least your philosophy of hospice, uh, is a perfect melding of mm -hmm. those two. Uh, some people have said, if I get put on hospice care, is it the time, the time to give up hope? Is that, is that an appropriate thing? It doesn't sound like it from what you're saying. No. <laughs> it sounds like the opposite. It is kind of a renewed hope It setting. is. Actually, uh, it's, uh, our mission, it, uh, we have a very simple mission which resonates very powerfully for us. Our mission is to bring hope, yes. to reduce fears, yeah. and to impact lives. Um, so hope can be anything as simple as, I, I, I do want to go to the ocean one more time and see the ocean, or I want to go to one more roundup over on Molokai. Hope can be that I want to have a night uh, where I can sleep the whole night free of pain. Yeah. Hope can be whatever that person wants it to be, see my grandson one more time. Um, reducing your fears is a real important part of what we do. I teach our staff yeah. that our job is to essentially walk through the valley of the shadow of death and to shine a light in the dark places because we have walked that walk so many times. Yeah. So how do I, with my experience, shine a light so that then you're not afraid? Because we know what we can anticipate and we can really ease that distress. Sure. And then finally, when we're able to see, help this family care for their loved one at home, even, if, even though it's difficult and yeah. hard to do, they always will remember, I kept my promise to dad. I kept dad at home. Yeah. And we, we took care of him and he knew that we loved him even in his last seconds of life. Yeah, that's, that's our mission. That's very, very special. I, I think a lot of the uncertainty for people is the biggest concern that they have. Uh, not just when they're sick, because uh, right. people <clears throat> sometimes need professional help to say, how sick am I? Can I come out of this? What support do I need? But also, like you said, those dark corners of the matter where you just don't know, will I suffer greatly yeah. at the end? Will I have access to a nurse? Will I have access to um, a doc or a physician assistant or whomever the right fit is for the, for the time? Yeah. Um, and you're able to explain those things. Is that part of the initial assessment? Oh, it's all of it. It's, and it's an ongoing part of how we, we relate to this family. Um, the, uh, the, the team assesses what the needs of the patient and family are. We work to the family to help them address those needs. And then we recognize that as time progresses, those needs change and they go back and forth. And yeah. that's okay. We've got nurses that are on call 24-7. Right. So in the middle of the night, a family can call because they have a question about pain. Or they can call because someone has died in the middle of the night and we're going to send a nurse to that home yeah. to ease that family's distress and to do the things that we need to do. Sure. It's, you know, I, you've mentioned so many things that I'd like to, to talk about. Uh, but I, I should point out one of them is how valuable what you offer as a service is because many, many, many times right. I think people because of uncertainty, and it's normal and it's reasonable, mm -hmm. don't know, should I be going to the emergency room? Should I be in the hospital? Should I be calling my doctor or nurse? Should I be, um, is this normal? And too often, I would say, people end up in the emergency department when they don't, number one, want to be there. Two, when the wait could be quite long. And three, when they're really going to get better care. And that is something to emphasize. Better care because it's personalized care. It's care that people are familiar with if they're in hospice. And we can probably deliver most of the care that's really needed for that individual in their own home right. with our doctors and our nurses and our APRNs on call. Right. Um, then they can get in the ER. You can do a good job in the ER, but we can do it in their home and then they don't have to endure the drive yeah. or the ride because that's a big burden. My mom had hospice care and the doctor said to mom when she began the care a couple of years ago uh -huh. um, was, we want to have hospice so that you don't have to worry about needing to come back in the hospital. And mom did not have to go to the hospital. She had mainland. Yes. Did not have to worry about going back in the hospital. And that's a promise that we really try to keep. Now, sometimes patients do. And that's okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll follow them. We'll, we'll see how they're doing. And we'll get them back home as fast as we can. Yes. Because there really is no place like home. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. Well, that's, I think that's kind of a... Um, a perfect place for us to pause. We're about halfway through our program, but uh, we're tackling the myths of hospice care. As Ken Zaria, who's our expert today on the show, says, there's no place like home. 
Hospice care is available to people in the state of Hawaii to ease their suffering, to ease their concerns, and really to give them uh, hope in the final stages of life. We'll be back in a moment. Hello, this is Martin Despain. I want to get you get excited about I'm about to say he's got the laws on it. For Hawaii and beyond, we're going to broadcast on Tuesdays, 5 p.m. here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m. where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in and aloha and thanks for watching. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman, welcome. We are co-hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm your host, Josh Green, Senator from the Big Island, Kona and Kau, and ER physician. Today I'm joined by Ken Zeri, who is an excellent uh, guy. I really like <laughs> him very much. Uh, he laughs, but he is doing just really blessed work. He is a leader here in hospice care. He's the president of Hospice Hawaii, has been a nurse uh, professional for many years, and in our first segment was able to explain kind of what hospice care is. We've discussed some of the myths about hospice. It is a place that you uh, get care, usually in your home. It is something that can restore hope. It's meant for people toward the end of life, in the last six months of life, and we're going to unpack that a little bit more as well. But Ken said many things about what hospice is, and one of the things it is is a way to alleviate fear and suffering. Yeah. Uh, some of the other myths here. Hospice is only for the last days of life. So that indeed is a myth. Hospice was designed to be for the last six months of life, and, and it's about a 40, 44-year-old um, uh, way of delivering care in America. I think the Medicare hospice benefit is about 40 years old. I'm sorry, it's about 35 years old. Yes. And, um, and it's never been designed for the last days of life. Yes. The reality of it is, is that we can't do the um, great things in three days. Right. Unfortunately, though, Josh, what we see is that 25% of our patients die in the first seven days. 30% yes. of our patients die in the first 10 days. Is that because they get to you too late because yeah. we didn't get them into the system? Okay. Because people are afraid of hospice. Sometimes hospice means I'm giving up. Uh -huh. Or um, it used to be that physicians would tell patients, old days, would say, there's nothing more I can do for you. It's time for hospice. Yeah. And that's, um, gosh, nobody would want hospice for them, right? Because it feels like you're being abandoned, and you're not. Yeah. The care is being, the, the focus of your care is being shifted onto a different goal. So, yeah. so um, we don't want hospice to be the last week of life. We still struggle with that yeah. here and on the mainland. Yeah, I, I see that a lot. I, you know, I've referred many individuals to hospice mm -hmm. care, um, and for full disclosure, probably, I don't know, probably to your hospice, uh, although I'm on the neighbor islands as a clinician, but I've seen a lot of people um, come into the ER several times, even though they have a, like, usually it's a severe uh, lung or heart problem or right. cancer. Right. And I finally mentioned to them, you know, there is this service called hospice care where I think you might get better care at home. Not that you can't still come in if, if God forbid, it's, you know, you're very scared or we need to give even more services. I don't know what they might be, but even more services than hospice might offer at that moment. Um, and they didn't know about it. Right. And then they realize, oh, I'm going to have a home care team. A team. You know. Yeah. And that's incredible. Uh, you had mentioned uh, some people worry that they can't keep their own doctor uh, when they go into hospice. Is that a myth? It's a myth. Okay. So we we do want people to keep their own physician. So if you were a primary care physician for a patient and you've been their PCP for ten years, right. You may have a relationship with them that you want to sustain. You want to be able to be a part of this. Part of the reason you got into medicine was to care for people, even in the midst of their dying. Yeah. And so we want to work with you in much the way that you want to. Some physicians really prefer to hand it off to the experts at Hospice and Palliative Care, at Hospice Hawaii, um, to just say, once you handle this and let us know what I can do. Yes. Others say, you know what, I want to stay engaged. And it's our job to ask that physician, how do you want to be engaged? Right. So, and, they, and they know them very well. I, I remember, I'll tell you this kind of funny story. Uh, I was in Kau on Big Island uh, providing hospice care for a patient of mine, very, very sweet guy who had, had um, came to me 
uh, with an advanced lung cancer. Sure. And he um, was not that old. He was in his late 60s. He had been a, um, a worker in the nuclear field, uh, checking warheads, actually. And uh, he had a PhD. His wife had a PhD, and they lived in the very rural parts of the state. He knew he was going to die. And I would, uh, through hospice, be able to get extra services to him right. and get him medicines at home and get him oxygen at home. And I just remember when this guy, uh, right before he died, he, his wife made a lasagna dinner for me and the local uh, um, Catholic priest, actually, who used to come and hang out socially. And he said, Green, I'm dying. And he was very appreciative <laughs> of the hospice care, and he didn't want to go into the hospital. And, nope. you know, he was happy that he was able to live out his final period of time. I think he, he was in for about two and a half, three months before he passed. Perfect. And he said, uh, there's a present for you in your car. Uh, don't shoot yourself. And I said, what, what are you doing? <laughs> it turns out he had given, uh, he was thankful for the home service and he put a, um, a kayak, had his wife, who was this little short person, uh, put the kayak on my Jeep and a spear gun. And <laughs> he gave that to me, which I then, I think, re-gifted to some nurses on my team who right. were just wonderful people. <laughs> but the sense of comfort that he had, the sense of being able to live at home, uh, to the end of his um, days in his own bed. Yep. These are the kind of things you seem to be offering. Everybody that needs it. Yeah. Josh, <clears throat> so as a physician involved in the care, you can say, I want him to have these pain medications and, I, and he needs this medical equipment in the home and he needs oxygen in the home. And um, all of those kind of typical barriers that exist to getting stuff in the home, yes. they just dissolve when hospice is in the way. Yeah. Uh, sorry, when hospice is in, in, involved. Right. We get those out of the way. So we, we don't need qualifying um, oxygen saturations to get oxygen. We say, is there distress? Is he short of breath? Great, get the oxygen out yes. there. That simple. So we're able to, to put those medications. We use, um, we use a local pharmacy service that delivers medications. And so, first of all, we're going to pay for that pain medicine. Yes. So if that pain medicine is costing $4,000 a week because it's a very expensive infusion, yes. we'll pay for it. And there's no cost to the patient and family. Uh -huh. We'll do what we need to do to keep them at home and comfortable. I, I wanted to ask you about that because um, we've established very clearly that hospice is a civilized and compassionate way to provide care. That I like, I, that. That, I like I, that. That I feel strongly about. Um, but then we go into these other questions. Um, you've described and I've described a lot of services that people might think, hey, is that expensive? Is that, how does that get afforded by a patient? How does the healthcare system afford that? I mean, I've, I've on the show many times had health economists, insurers, and so on. We always seem to be talking about how expensive healthcare is. How is it that you or I can be providing so much service at home to an individual who is really ill, mm -hmm. possibly, um, without the worry about cost? What is the mechanism? Well, um, so as a president, I always worry about the money, but as a nonprofit, we're very generously supported by our community. So okay. that the community essentially says to me, you don't worry about this, you just provide the care. Okay. And I love being that kind of a re relationship with our community. Yeah. Medicare pays a, a daily amount of money. It's about an average of $195, more or less. On Oahu, it's about that, and a little bit less on the neighbor islands. Uh -huh. So we have to make that work. So even the, on the days that we don't see the patient, we're still being paid. Right. And it's kind of a whole um, risk model for us. So we may have a patient that their care costs thousands and thousands of dollars a week, and we may have a patient whose care costs you know, a couple hundred dollars a week. Yeah. We lump it all together, and we make it work. Yes. Um, I, I'm really happy to say we've never had to say no to somebody who didn't have insurance and couldn't pay for it. Yeah. That's the, ben the beauty of being a local not-for-profit. Yes. So for the family, though, there's no payment for this. There's no co-pay for this. They don't have to pay this, right? right. I, you know, the, the question is, is, why does it work? Because this is how I grew up in the world of hospice. This is the only reimbursement model we ever had. So it works because we make it work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, we know how to live within our, our means in general. So it's, we do. It, it's, it seems like it also is a very important adjunct to the hospital-based healthcare system. Again, I, I, on the show, I've talked about how we don't have sometimes enough hospital beds or right. we don't have enough providers in the hospital or right. people getting readmitted to the hospital. That's a very big issue now for Medicare. Right. Um, and it seems like hospice care by providing care at home rather than an individual going to the hospital, and all due respect to my hospital friends who I love. I mean, they do great work at Queens and Straub and HHSC, but it's very expensive to spend a day in the hospital, especially if you have 
significant health needs could be five, six, seven thousand or more dollars a day. Right. This is way less. Right. Is there some kind of balance that's been struck so that some of those resources that are getting saved rather than having someone, number one, didn't want to be at the hospital because they were afraid and chose not to be, but two, you know, if someone who is otherwise sick, 85 year old, got bad cancer, spends their last month in the hospital, that bill could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands. So are we saving money as a healthcare system by having services like hospice? We are indeed. So study after study has demonstrated that um, for, um, and, and these have been studies that have been done by Duke University, right? That yeah. says that um, for the last three months of care, yes. that if the patient has hospice and they're compared to the patient who does not have hospice, then on average, Medicare saves 2,900 and change Interesting. on that individual. Uh -huh. So when you look at a million, uh, 1.5 million people having hospice care, uh, do the math fast. Right. It's billions of dollars are yeah. saved. It's over a billion bucks every yeah. year at least. Yeah. Oh, that would be three billion right there. Right. Yeah. Because we're able to, to save that yeah. money. Now, there is a trade-off. Um, when you have your loved one in the hospital, then there's nurses around the clock caring for that person. Yeah. When your loved one is at home, you're doing the work as a family member most of the time. A hospice team intermittently visits. Yeah. So the, the nurse might visit once or twice a week. The nurse's aide might visit two, three, four, five times a week. Yes. But most of the time you're caring for your loved one. So that's the trade-off. Yes. And we're going to support you and teach you how to do it. Right. And, and then from time to time, if we have somebody who can't do it, then we can bring them into our Kailua home. Right. And we have a co-pay there. It's a, more expensive. Yeah. But we also do a lot of charity care there as well. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that it, it is a different system, no doubt. It is. Uh, but again, this is just one person's perspective who, I'll be very honest, I think that, that hospice care is extraordinarily important and valuable to, to people and to our state. Um, when you go into the hospital, there's lots of chaos and mayhem and there's flashing lights and there's beeps and there's buzzers and it sometimes even drives <laughs> me batty in the ER. And I think that when people are headed uh, towards the end of life, there is a special value of tranquility. And that's at least it occurs to me that yeah. that's what you're offering. So I'm laughing because, frankly, uh, in my family, when when uh, you would come into our family's household, there's lots of chaos, but it's it's laughter and love and teasing and and honest expressions of fear and loss. Yeah. And and what you really do see in hospice care is that when you go into home, hopefully the family is living the way they've always lived, even in the midst of this loved one dying. Yes. Um, I've been to to homes where. Um, I did a, a death call. It was a patient had died. I went to their home, and it was one of those towers out in, in um, Hawaii Kai area, right? Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm way up to the top of the tower, and the trade winds were coming through, and there was beautiful jazz music playing, and it was such a peaceful and tranquil time that this person had their transition from life to death in that place. And I've been to places where it has been wailing and gnashing of teeth, and this is perfect for that family as well. Yes. Um, and so you get to see life in its reality. Yeah. at that sacred, sacred time. And that's what we try to help families achieve. Yeah, and you're achieving it in a more natural setting because whatever their home setting is, it's their natural setting. And frankly, the hospital is always yeah. a, a comparatively unnatural setting. Foreign territory. Unless you're working there all the time. <laughs> right. right. And even me, I feel more comfortable at home. Right, than where, where the kids are going to be and the dog's going to be on the bed, right? Or the cat's going to be saying, I'm hungry, feed me, yeah, right? Yeah, I, that's life. I, I think you're absolutely on it. So we have only a few minutes left in our show. You've touched on many of the myths. Hospice care, is it for any age or is it just for the elderly? Hospice care is for any age. We have a the state's uh, kind of only formal pediatric hospice program where we can admit um, children as young as newborns um, and as old as 105 years old yeah. and everything in between. If, God forbid, a young one's going, then they also could get support at home. Uh, choosing hospice means giving up all medical treatment, obviously. No, we change the focus of your medical treatment. Yes, yeah. and, and it's not just for the end of uh, your last days of life because some people even graduate from hospice. That's a good thing. The, the bad part about graduating from hospice is all those wonderful wraparound services, we have to pull them back. Yeah. So we work hard to, to be careful about that and to, and to plan it right, um, to, to make sure that that transition is smooth. And when we need to bring them back on, we can indeed. Okay, so if I were gonna sum up, Ken, uh, an important service here in the state of Hawaii and in all states, hospice care, you guys provide it if 
Anybody ever has any questions, they call you where? Hospice Hawaii is 924-9255 or hospicehawaii.org. Okay, and I know we've got many viewers uh, and listeners across the state uh, on the neighbor islands. If you call Hospice Hawaii and you happen to be living in Hilo or Kona or elsewhere, we'll, we'll Ken, get you we'll, in touch. Ken yeah. will get you there to the local group. Yeah. Uh, I've been very honored today to have Mr. Ken Zeri. He's a uh, hospice executive. He runs Hospice Hawaii, has for many years. He's on the critical boards across the country and he knows what's happening in this discipline. If your family member is suffering or if someone is in need of extra services uh, toward the end of life, this is a great service to avail yourself of. It's a civilized and humane way to get healthcare. So thanks for sharing today. Thanks, Josh. A pleasure to be here. You bet.